Kishalom, praise the Lord. Welcome everyone to class. Thank you, um, online students, for um, joining us. Welcome all. Welcome to the in-person students, and also a, a, a warm welcome to our e-learning students who will be listening to the lecture later on. Okay, so we were studying chapter five, and uh, we were trying to understand the incarnation okay what is incarnation god becoming man okay the eternal word becoming flesh god taking on human form okay it was not just merely god inhabiting a human form but it was god becoming fully human in every aspect okay and uh, which uh, uh, reference were we meditating on? Okay, Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 to 8. Okay, we were looking at the seven steps in the incarnation. Okay, the first one was Christ was in the form of God. So what is form? Does form mean... Uh, denotes something that is external or outward? What is form? Yes, it's not just outward form or shape, but it's your basic nature. Thank you, Sanjay. It is who you are. It refers to your being. Okay, it refers to your attributes. It effect, uh, uh, relates to your essential nature. Okay. And what is who you are, your nature and attributes is seen outwardly. So when we talk about form, it just does not denote something that is outward or external, but it's talking about your being, essentially your nature, your um, attributes. Okay. So Christ existed as God and he had all the nature, the attributes and the being that pertains to the divine nature. Okay, he also was human. He had all the nature and the being that was of us human beings. Okay, so he was fully God and he was fully man. He was truly God. He was truly man. Okay, so we when we use the word form, we don't talk about it. It's, a, it's we we think of the shape of something, but the Greek word has more than just the shape. Okay, it means the very essence, the very nature, the very attributes of who God is or who Jesus is. Okay, and uh, we also spoke about the word being. What is the meaning of being? Who being in the form of God. So what's the meaning of the word being? It basically talks about the very essence of who a person is, which cannot be changed, okay? All of us is, are human beings. We are not fish or we are not mammals, you know, or we are not uh, birds. We have the being of a human, okay? And which cannot be changed. If you like birds, you like to fly, you cannot change yourself unless you get into an aircraft and fly. Or you, you know, do something else. But your basic being is who you are, which cannot be changed. Okay. So we looked at uh, that phrase, Christ was in the form of God. Uh, Christ was equal with God. We didn't study that in detail because we already studied that in chapter 2. Then we looked at he did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Okay. Which mean, what does it mean? Did not consider it robbery. What it means? Did not consider, did not deem. Means what? He did not regard, he did not hold on to. He did not grasp. You know, when you're falling off a cliff or a mountain or you're falling off somewhere, you hold on to grasp on to something. It's not something that he held on to. Okay. Uh, but he was he was willing to refrain from using his nature of deity. So what are some of the things that Jesus refrained from using? Sorry? His position, his rank, okay. What else? 
his divinity he was he was divine so what uh, what are some of the things he refrained of using of his divinity i mentioned that thank you lucy his attributes is nature nature of being omnipotent you must mention this omnipotent omnipresent and omniscient though he was god he was fully god he was omnipotent omnipresent and omniscient but when he became a human being he refrained from using it he did not use it okay what else he did not use what else he did not use hello everyone i mention all this i keep repeating it over and over again sister his glory his glory okay glory of deity thank you sister getrud okay the glory of deity why did he refrain from using the glory of deity because he was using sonship glory why did he use sonship glory because he was a uh, human and divine so when he was human being he used the sonship glory because he didn't want to be equal with god in that glory why didn't he want to be equal with god in that glory <laughs> <laughs> i like that's my i like the laugh that used to get through <laughs> for us to experience his nature and to recognize uh, we to recognize god's nature through him thank you lucy one person in my class who listens to my lectures worth the time and the effort how many times i've been explaining about the glory of god glory of god hello everyone please wakey wakey these are very important truths please read and come it shows that nobody is reading okay um yes sanjay says god's full glory is too much for us to experience or receive we can't actually look at god okay we can't experience his nature his, his him relating to us because he lives in unapproachable light again we can't see him so he refrained from using his the uh, glory of deity and he took on the sonship glory so that we can experience him in a real tangible way we can touch feel see him experience him in a real way just like you can touch feel experience another human being okay thank god for lucy and thank god for sanjay okay uh, anything else what else did he refrain from using what else did he refrain his right to be honored and worshiped as god he did not hold on to his glorious estate and heavenly privileges willing to give up his right to be honored and worshiped as god no problem miriam uh yes okay so his right to be honored and worshiped as god now i'd like you all to listen may take down notes and please go back and read i'm doing very very little portions and i think i keep on repeating the same thing again and again and again because these are very important truths okay so you all need to have these truths if you are not able to understand please ask after class but please go back and listen to the lecture because the lecture is also posted on the stream page for online students and uh, for in person students you can also access the google classroom videos that are posted but these are important truths which you all need to know so please a uh, give space uh, attention and you know spend some time reading it will not take you more than half an hour to read okay uh and it says here that he emptied himself okay some translation says he uh, he made himself of no reputation but some translation says he emptied himself so when when people read he emptied himself what do they say what does this meaning what do they mean when they say they emptied himself Oh no how do they look at this word emptied himself jesus emptied himself how do people translate this or well, how do people understand it 
refrain he refrain okay he refrain people basically say he uh, he emptied himself means he gave up his nature of being god okay but you need to tell him tell them that emptied himself means what not giving up his nature of god because he was fully god and he was fully man but he refrained from using okay like some of you have said yes he did not consider it robbery to be equal with god lucy says coming down to a different level or rank yes he came down to he lowered himself humbled himself you know it's talking about a rank okay where he came down okay and andrew says he gave up his marvelous glory and nature as god not gave up uh, he had it not that he gave it up but he refrained from using refrain means he did not use it he stopped using it it was there but he did not use it okay that is the meaning of refrain uh, not that he gave up he did not give up he was fully god he still had that nature but he refrained from using it okay you all understand what's the meaning of refrain right he ceased he avoided it okay he did not use it he renounced okay so that is the meaning of a refrain for example um uh, you have uh, like a gov if you're a if you are a government authority you have the authority to use the government ve vehicle but you refrain from using the government vehicle you use your own personal vehicle you have the access to use it but you don't you refrain from using it okay and then um so we it's not that he emptied himself not that he emptied himself of being god or emptied himself of being the nature of god and took on the nature of man he had the nature of god and he had the nature of man but he chose to refrain him self okay he made himself of no reputation means what he made himself of no reputation is also again he emptied himself he refrained in exercising or in expressing his divine attributes okay uh, he it means he came down in level or rank okay so that is what we looked at in the last class we'll continue with the fifth statement in philippians chapter 2 which is he took on the form of a bond servant he took on the form of a bond servant okay so he took on the form of a bond servant this describes how jesus emptied himself means though he was god he took on the form of a bond servant okay which means uh, he you know he, he he lowered himself in in rank okay uh, now what is the meaning of bond servant what is the meaning of bond servant you have a, a slave you keep him for a period of time you know there is a bond made between him that he has to serve you for a certain period okay like a slave bond servant is a slave okay who else talks about uh, calls himself as a bond servant in the bible joseph okay who refers or calls himself as a bond servant in the bible paul paul yes thank you warren apostle paul thank you lucy you know uh, apostle paul says you know um, uh, a bond servant of christ jesus you know what does he mean by bond servant what does bond servant mean any idea it basically means you know in deuteronomy god said you know when you have a slave in your household they will work for you for 6 years on the 7th year you have to let the slave go free okay but if the slave says hey i love my master he has been very nice to me he's been very good to me me and my family will serve my master for the rest of my life then what the ma the master has to do he has to take the slave to the temple which solomon built or the tabernacle and he will have to take a anvil and bow the ear of the slave 
okay make a hole so it shows that he's a bond servant that means a bond servant is somebody who willingly you know submits to his master willingly uh, is uh, willing to give all of his obedience his devotion his uh, his service and is willingly subjecting himself to the authority of his master and that is why paul calls himself bond servant when he writes in romans and he writes in timothy he says paul a bond servant of an apostle and a bond servant of christ jesus what does paul mean by saying bond servant he says hey even though i'm an apostle i'm somebody who willingly has submitted myself to the uh, obedience to the submission and yielding myself my uh, my devotion my service to the lord jesus christ so that is the meaning of a bond servant so here we see that um, you know jesus is called as a servant right where was he is referred to as a servant we studied about servant jesus as a servant where did we study servant yeah. songs remember the servant songs in isaiah yes so uh, we see that he is already uh, prophesied as a servant okay we, we jesus is called the servant of god in the book of isaiah okay and um, we see that jesus continually says in the gospel we read that he is he says i have come to do the will of my father john chapter 5 verse 30 okay jesus says i've come to do the will of my uh, father and in hebrews chapter 10 verse 7 can somebody read hebrews chapter 10 verse 7 please hebrews chapter 10 verse 7 then i said behold i have come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will o oh god yes so he's come to do the will of god so he's even though he's deity even though he's god you know he lowers himself in rank he's willingly submitting yielding to the authority of the father even though he is co equal with god the father okay so jesus is setting us an example here you no know? he's saying hey even though i am you know i live in an approachable light and awesome and great no one can understand me and comprehend me yet i am willing to uh, submit myself yield myself in devotion in submission uh, uh, in obedience to the will of the father okay so no heights that god can take us should be an excuse for us not to submit to him you know god can take us to greater heights we can become great people big people uh, one day but even then we need to remember that we need to be like paul we need to be like jesus like a bond servant willingly yielding submitting in obedience to uh, doing the father's will so here it says he took on the form of a bond servant in other translations taking Now the Greek word for took or taking is labon, which means does not just mean exchange. That not does not mean that Jesus exchanged for some time to be a bond servant, but it means addition. In addition to who he was, in addition to him being fully deity, fully God, he takes on the role of a servant. Though he was human, as a human being, he took on the role of a servant. So here the word. took on or taking does not imply exchange he does not exchange for some time to be a servant leaving out his um, deity but in addition to who he was in addition to being god deity you know he takes on the form of a bond servant so basically jesus is teaching us humility even though he becomes a bond servant even though paul was a great apostle did so many things did uh, great missionaries you know set up so many churches wrote so many letters received so much of revelation but yet he was willing to yield himself submit himself as a bond servant are you all able to understand yes no yes yes okay thank you 
um, the next phrase is that he came in the likeness of man. He came in the likeness of man. We've already looked at that quite in detail. Okay. Uh, it means that Jesus likeness means not just, you know, he he took on a human form or he possessed a human being, but in every way he was fully human just like you and me, which means he submitted himself to the limitations of a human being. Our human experience, you know, uh, human frailties, the human weaknesses in every way in reality he was, he took on the fullness of humanity okay so we will study uh, christ's humanity how he was fully human in the next chapter okay and the last phrase is he was found in the uh, uh, found in appearance as a man okay why did he appear as a man because no human eyes could see deity in the natural sense okay or us as human beings we cannot look at god because of his greatness, his awesomeness, his glory, okay? But he appeared as a man so that we can reach out to him, we can touch him, we can experience him, we can hear him speak, we can speak to him, and we can understand him, okay? So he lived among us as a human being in, in the fullest sense so that we can see, touch, relate to him, understand him, and we can also understand and relate to the heart of the Father or the nature of God or the nature of the Father. And this was, we can understand God now in a greater and deeper sense than the people in the Old Testament was because of Christ's incarnation. Okay, this was possible because of the incarnation, God becoming man, we could understand God, we can relate to him, we can understand the heart of the father in a deeper and in a more real way. Okay, uh, so we know that in the Old Testament, or, uh, you know, in scripture, in the Old Testament, uh, the whole aspect of God was something that was hidden from man, they could not understand God, as God revealed himself, they were able to understand but incarnation was god manifesting himself in the flesh what is the meaning of manifesting or god manifested in the flesh means what yeah something that is revealed something that is displayed something that is showed to us demonstrated we can see we can understand we can relate to Okay, so look at what uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16 says. Can somebody read that please? 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16. 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. Amen. So First Timothy, uh, in First Timothy, Paul is writing to Timothy, he's revealing the mystery of godliness to uh, Timothy. Okay. In the, in the previous verses, he's talking about how you need to be godly. He's telling Timothy, hey, as a young person, Timothy, you have to maintain a purity, the right conscious holiness. You have to live a godly life. And then he's talking about the mystery of godly. Um, ness. Now, this phrase, um, without controversy, okay, Paul is basically saying that this is without dispute or this is without any question. You can't dispute or can't question. What can't you question and dispute or argue about? That God manifested himself in the flesh, okay, that he was justified in the spirit. He was seen by angels. He preached to the Gentiles. He was dead, buried. He was and he received up in glory. All this Paul is saying, this is the truth. Okay. You can't debate about it. You can't dispute about it. You can't question it. Why is he saying this to Timothy? It's because of the false teachings that were happening at the church of Ephesus, where Timothy is the leader, where he's looking after the churches there. So he's saying, hey, Timothy, this is the truth. Okay, so without controversy means it cannot be disputed beyond question. And says, um, you know, he says the, the mystery of godliness was manifested in the flesh. What does it mean of mystery? 
What's the meaning of mystery? Something that was hidden. Okay. So, you know, the ways and the nature of God was hidden from mankind, but it's no longer hidden because it is revealed to us in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Okay. So he's saying this mystery which was hidden from us, which was we did not know about God, who God is, how he works, how he relates to us. It's not no longer something hidden. It's no longer a mystery, but it's what was hidden, what was a mystery is now manifested in whom? In the flesh, in the eternal word that is Jesus Christ. Okay. So therefore, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it teaches us about the incarnation. The one who had previously existed, the one who was, but was unknown to the world, is now made known to the world in the form of the flesh where we can relate, we can understand, we can see him and we can know him in a better and in a deeper way. Okay. And also this eternal God becoming flesh is God with us. Okay. Emmanuel, God with us. Look at what Matthew chapter 1 verse 23 says. Can somebody read that please? Matthew chapter 1 verse 23. Behold, the virgin shall be with the child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. So incarnation is God with us, is Emmanuel God with us, which means God with us means somebody who's real to us, tangible, somebody we can experience God with men as a human being, as a man who we can relate, can touch, feel, we can sense, we can know, okay? So that is incarnation, how God manifested himself in flesh, okay? So what are some of the things that we have seen thus far or observed about incarnation? Is God revealing himself in the person of Jesus Christ, okay? Now, we know that God is unchangeable, okay? And uh, But Christ is the full, complete revelation of God. So everything that we need to know about God is fully, finally revealed in the person and work of Jesus Christ. So we don't need any more revelation, okay? Everything that we need to know about God is given to us in Scripture, in the Bible. It's only for us to... what. Revelation we receive is the understanding of what is already being revealed in Scripture. So there is no more revelation that is needed. Okay. We also saw that in incarnation, God came to be with man. When God became man, he did not cease from being God. He did not stop from being God. He was all God, all man, truly God, truly man, 100% God, 100% man. But we see that he refrained from using some of his nature and attributes of being, uh, uh, of, of the deity, of, of God, okay? Um, and also we need to know that incarnation is not about man becoming God in some mystical ex experience like we see in, in other myth myth mythologies where, you know, God came and possessed a woman or a bird or an animal. It's not that. It is God becoming fully man. It's not possessing or some, you know, mystical experience or gaining some divine enlightenment. Okay. And we also saw that in incarnation, God becomes total, is becoming man in the fullness of the sense, totally spirit, soul, and body, which means he was really and totally in the fullest sense, he was God and man. Okay. Any questions, any doubts anyone has? This lesson, any questions, any doubts? Can you take the mic, please? In first Timothy 316, one word says seen by angels. Hmm. It's about Jesus Christ. Yes. He was seen by angels means when when was he seen by angels? Sorry, when was he seen by angels? In the temptation, 
after he was, uh, you know, the angels came and fed him uh, in the garden of Gethsemane, okay, when um, um, he was um, in the garden of Gethsemane, when he prayed, Father, not my will, but yours be done, the angels came and strengthened him, okay. Um, at his tomb, when he rose again, there was the angel seated there who spoke to the women. The later the angels also spoke, you know, and they thought they mistook him for the gardener. Okay. So seen by angels. Yeah. Justified in the spirit means what? What is the meaning of look at the same verse? He was justified in the spirit means what? What is the meaning of justification? Without any sin, God looks at you just as you have never sinned. You're made right. So justification, uh, 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 righteousness, um, you know, all are synonyms that can be used. So justification basically means you're made right with God. So when you're saying justified in the spirit means what? Was Jesus sinful that later on he was justified in the spirit? He was sinless. So what does it mean he was justified in the spirit? Which means that he was always right before God. He's, he was always right before God. Okay. So these are the truths he's saying are standard truths we cannot debate and discuss about it. Okay. Any other questions? Anyone else has? In chapter 5, before we move on to chapter 6. No questions? Okay, if there are no questions, no doubts, we'll move on to chapter 6, the humanity of Christ. Okay, so in this chapter, we'll basically look at how Jesus was fully human. Okay, and we'll try to understand how he willingly restricted himself to the limitations of a human being. How he was willing to submit himself, you know, to the limitations of a human being. Okay. So when we say that Jesus was truly human in every sense, okay, or he limited himself to the fullness of humanity, does it also mean that he was sinful like us human beings? Yes, no. Can we have some answers? No, sister. No, thank you. Um, thank you all. So, yes, he was human in every way except that he was sinless. Okay? Except that he was sinless. Okay? Yes, Sanjay says he was tempted, yet he did not sin. Okay? So, he was truly human in every sense and uh, yet he was sinless and we will kind of grasp the importance of his incarnation in this chapter. Now, why was it necessary for God to become man? Why was it necessary for God to become human? We already studied this. We already mentioned it in the last two, three classes. Why? Why was it necessary or important for God to become human? He could set as an example of how it is how, how to live our life. Okay, Warren says to model um, how to live our lives. Yes, thank you, Warren. To reveal himself, to reveal Father, and be how to be obedient for Father. Okay, to reveal the heart of the Father to us in a real uh, way, so that we can experience and know who God is. Okay. Uh, Lucy says to recognize God's love for us. Okay, that is uh, revealing the Father. You were saying something. Sorry, can you take the mic, please? To bridge the gap between mankind and God, like what Adam did and first Adam and the last Adam. Okay, first Adam and the last Adam. Okay. And sister, as a spirit being, he cannot be sacrificed for the humankind. So he had to be a, a mankind. Okay, so he came as a human being to make the full, sufficient, perfect sacrifice. He was the lamb who took on our sins. He, so he was 
the substitutionary work of Christ. He was he he substituted himself in our place. We had to die, but he died for us. Okay, yes. What else? Also to set an example. Okay, so three simple things. Set an example. Reveal the Father heart of God. Uh, so in Christ we see the full final revelation of God and also to become, you know, the substitutionary work, identifying with us as human beings and dying in our place, making the full sufficient perfect sacrifice for us. Okay. So what, because of what Jesus did as a human being, we have the privilege of being his sons and daughters. We are also able to understand God, relate to him, like he said, you know, bridge the gap between God and man. Okay. And he also modeled for us, like Warren says, so we can also model, we can also live. So like some of you say, hey, I can't overcome temptation. We have no excuse because Jesus was fully human. He overcame temptation. You know, I can't be obedient and yield to the Father's will. Jesus was fully human. He yielded and submitted to doing the will of the father even in difficult circumstances we can't i can't forgive but jesus on the cross forgave the sinners as a human being so we can forgive i can't do mighty signs miracles and wonders i can't flow in the supernatural jesus was a model he did it he said we can do greater things than us so all of this he set as a standard set as a model so that we can live out of that and we can do the works that he did Okay, so Jesus is not just come to be a model, but in a model in the sense that he wanted us to represent him after he went back to the Father. So here we are basically here to represent Jesus. So you and I are the Jesus now of today's time where we have to live, walk and do the things that he has done so that we can represent him. We can represent God to mankind. Okay. So we look at um, how Jesus, you know, was fully human, how he limit, willingly restricted himself to the limitations of human being. Okay. So the first thing we look at, he was born of a woman. Okay. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. Can somebody read that, please? Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. Galatians 4, verse 4. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son born of a woman, born under the law. Yes. So the first step that Christ took to become a man or in the fullness of humanity was that he was born of a woman, which means he had human origin. Okay. He just did not come down from the, from heaven. He could have done that, right? He could have come down as a man and just done three years ministry and you know died on the cross hello go back to the father okay but he limited himself in every way to the frailties the weaknesses of a human he took on human origin as well can you imagine this eternal god who's so powerful who's so great who's so mighty who's so awesome He's so awesome than all who surround him also in heaven. But, you know, limiting himself to this physiological process of being developing, of developing himself in, a, uh, in the womb of a woman. Okay. And then process of childbirth, you know, infancy, growing up as a, as a child, as a, uh, as a youth, as an adult, as a man. Okay, so we see that in every way he went through the normal process. Why did he go through the normal process? Why do you think he went through the normal process? Why? Why did he have to go through all this normal process? Hello? You know, he in his human form went through all that we also go through and so that we can, sorry? We can also relate we, to what he went through as on a human, though being God. Okay. We can relate to him. He can also relate to us in, in our weaknesses and our frailties. Right? Okay. So Jesus' humanity can be seen uh, in uh, physiologically as a child he grew up. 
okay luke chapter 2 verse 40 we, we see that he was born as an infant as a child you know as a boy as a young adult youth and then as a man also intellectually um, okay sanjay says also for scripture or prophecy to be fulfilled yes but why was also prophecy given regarding him being born of a virgin see why sanjay says the reason why he was born as a you know conceived in the mother's womb and born as a child is because to fulfill the scripture and the prophecies but i'm saying why were even the scriptures and the prophecies given regarding his conception and him being born. It was pre-planned. Why did God plan it that way? It was God's ultimate plan for redemption. Okay. So that he can identify us with us in every way, from conception till death. Right? He can identify with human weaknesses and frailties. Lucy says, setting us an example in the midst of trials and temptations. Okay, thank you. So we see intellectually how was he human in every way. He increased in the wisdom, stature, and the favor with God and man. Luke chapter 2 verse 52. Okay, we see that Jesus increased in wisdom, stature, and favor with God and man. Which shows to us that he was not omni, omniscient. Yes, he refrained from using his nature of being omniscient, but he increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. So what does that teach us? He limited himself, okay. What else does it teach us? He was normal as human. Okay, thank you, Nelson. What else? It teaches us that when Jesus had to increase in wisdom, stature, and favor with God and man, we too need to increase in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. I don't know if you pray, God, give me favor. You know, give me favor with man and also favor in your sight. How many of you pray that? pray that okay because jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with god and man okay what is the meaning of stature basically your height tall your build okay so it's basically growing so jesus grew in his wisdom his understanding his stature with in favor with god and man okay in a way, he too went to Bible college, Sanjay says. Which Bible college did he attend, Sanjay? <laughs> Where was the Bible college? Yeah, you're synagogue. right. Sorry. Synagogue. Synagogue, okay. Yes, his teachers, yes. Yeah. So when Jesus quoted uh, yeah. scripture to... Sorry, get through. He's quoted the uh, scriptures. Yes. Uh, when he quoted scripture in temptation, do you think he was using his uh, omniscience as God? No. It means that he was well versed and taught in the Old Testament law. In those, the, those days, he had the Old Testament law. Okay. And uh, every Jewish parent would teach them, right? Because God tells, you know, teach your children when you sit down and you're lying down, when you're walking, when you're eating, when you're sleeping, teach them the laws and the commands. Okay. So we see that Jesus himself had to increase in wisdom. Okay. He had to learn the word, study the word, you know, study the Old Testament law as well. Okay. Biologically, what are some of the things as a human being? How was he bio biologically human being? He, 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 felt, hungry, he felt hungry, he felt thirsty. Sorry, Warren? He felt hungry, he felt thirsty. He felt hungry, he felt thirsty. When was he hungry? After fasting, 40 days. When else was he hungry? Fig tree, yes, he was hungry. Look at the fig tree. No, had leaves but no fruit. What else? When was he thirsty? 
on the cross on the cross samaritan woman yes he goes and asks her for a drink he was thirsty and he was hungry also because the disciples went to buy food okay what else he felt pain yes what was the pain he felt Lazarus's grave yes he he cried okay he felt the pain of losing the loved ones he wept, he wept yes. yes what else pain he felt he, yes gethsemane when he when he prayed to the father he felt the burden of taking on the sins of the entire human race he was sinless Okay, but he was taking on the sin. It was imagine it was so detestable for a sinless God, a sinless man, to take on the sins of the world. He felt that pain. What else? Where else he felt pain? On the cross, yes, of course, yes. Immense pain, excruciating pain. When else did he feel pain? When he did the miracles and these Pharisees and Sadducees says, why did he do the miracle on a Sabbath? He felt the pain. Eh? How can these people not feel pain for a crippled man? A man who was invalid, lying down there for 37 years, 34, 37 years. You know, he felt the pain of their hard-heartedness. Okay. So uh, biologically, we see that uh, he was human in every sense, intellectually, psychologically as well. Yes, he was uh, tired. He slept in the boat. Okay. Yes, he also felt the pain when his disciples did not believe. Okay, abandoned him. You no, know, Peter disowned him. He felt the pain of being rejected, disowned. Yes. Okay, we'll stop here. Anyone has any questions? Any questions? No questions? Okay, so when can we have our um, first assessment? On the first four lessons, any date anyone would like to suggest? Can we have it next Wednesday? That is the 21st. Is 21st fine for all of you? Wednesday, 21st. Thank you, Lucy. Mr. Thank you, Gabriel. Ma'am, uh, I'm having my exams. Yeah, but for Amita, we can't. When are you having your exams? Ma'am, uh, it's uh, scheduled to begin from 11, uh, 19th. 19th. Sister, I'm, I'm away uh, next week. I'm away on work. Sorry, Warren, I can't hear you. Sorry, I'm away on work next week if, uh, on Wednesday. Wednesday and Thursday. Sorry, I didn't get what you said, please. Can you repeat that again? Uh, yeah, sure. I'm, I'm away on work uh, next week, Wednesday and Thursday. You're away for work? Yes, that's right, yeah. Okay. So when should you, when do you want it? Can you suggest a date, please? What about 15th Thursday? 15th is fine? 15th is fine for all. In person, we'll, I'll, I'm going to give you a different design. 15th for online students is fine? Yes, 15th is good. Okay, 15th is good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Sister, what will be the pattern of the exam, like before or else? Yeah, the same pattern, sister. Fill in the blanks, multiple choice, uh, all of those things. Okay. Same thing. Okay. And with some time. Sorry? Uh, with some one or two days time, right, sister? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, I'll give you one. I'll give you lots of time. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. Thank you. But I'll give you lots of time. Uh, but the important thing is I want you all to be honest in doing it. I want you to read the notes you know, and not doing it in a dishonest way, I would appreciate that because uh, we're all Bible college students. God is not looking at your grades. He's looking at your honesty and integrity. That is what matters most to him. So I think that is very, very important. I think we need to be honest in every little thing that we do. Okay. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for your valuable time. Have a blessed day and a week ahead. God bless. Thank you. Bye.